Do you have open country scenery on your layout? If so, you probably need some fences. Well, I am building a fence for a farm scene on my layout, and I'm going to show you how I do it starting right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and I've been building this farm scene, including a farmhouse, an old barn, a cornfield, and more. Well, today I'm going to build a fence around that cornfield, and I'm going to show you the materials and the techniques I use to build it. So, let's head on over to the workbench and get started. This video is brought to you by Midwest Model Railroad. With 15,000 square feet of inventory and one day shipping, whether in person or online, they are your one-stop model railroad shop. MidwestModelRR.com, link in the description. The first step in building my fence is building the corner braces. If you're not experienced in fence building, let me take a moment to explain just a little bit of the physics of this feature as it is a key component of the fence. These fences are built with wire that is stretched to make the fence rigid and keep the livestock where they belong without the fence sagging so they can step over it. To stretch the wire and keep it tight, you need a very solid corner to stretch it from. If you simply stretch the wire from a post without a brace, the post over time will lean into the fence and loosen the wire. To prevent this lean, a second post or brace post is set just inside of the corner post and a corner brace is set in between the two posts. So my first step was to build these corner braces. In the real world, these braces are often made from local tree trunks, especially hard, long-lasting wood like hedge or bodark. In North Texas, however, where I model, there aren't very many of these large, very hardwood trees so corners are often made from creosote posts or sometimes from steel pipe. In my case, working with the material that I have at hand, I'm going to model these corners made from large posts. Specifically, I am using 3 32nd inch square stock for the posts and 1 16th inch square stock for the braces. This is all basswood. Now, I'm building a model so the only posts that will actually be set in the ground will be the corner posts. The brace posts will only need to be in contact with the ground and look like they are set in. For these corner posts, I'm cutting them an extra 3 eighths of an inch long to set into the foam base and to hold the whole thing up. I cut all of these wood parts with my MicroMark Chop It. This is an easy way to cut numerous parts at the same length rather quickly. The Chop It and Chop It XL are still available at Micromark, and I have a discount code in the description down below this video that will save you 10% on any regularly priced items at Micromark. You may want to check that out. I also used the Chop It to cut the braces at 45 degrees on the end. I then sanded the pieces, not enough to make them smooth, but just enough to remove any burrs and chips from the ends where I cut them. With the corner brace pieces prepped, I pre-assembled the corners ahead of installation. I did this by hand and by eye, gluing the brace into place on the corner posts, and when that glue had dried, I glued the brace posts on, eyeballing each assembly to make sure that the tops of the posts were close to the same height. These are generally built somewhat crudely, so perfection is not my real goal here just that the brace posts will be in contact with the scenic base and that the corners look right. Again, I built these in four stages, allowing each set of glue joints to dry before moving on to the next piece. When these assemblies were completely dry, I stained them with hunter line stains. I started using a medium brown, but this basswood has a pretty open grain and soaks up a lot of stain, so they were going to come out way too dark. So I switched to light gray color. This color actually mixed with the open grain of wood to make an ideal color in my eyes. The brace pieces were a little more sanded to begin with, so they didn't come out as dark as the posts, and so I gave the braces only a second coat to match them up with the posts. At this point, the corners were ready to install. Next, I turned to the steel line posts. These steel line posts are typically T-shaped, so I used Plastruck T-shaped stock. Now these posts are going to be a little oversized or chunky prototypically, but I simply didn't have or know of anything that was closer to prototype size, 
and if I did, there was a good chance it was going to be too delicate to plant into the seam. Again, I used my chop it to cut the post to length to have five foot of visible posts with three eighths of an inch planted in the ground. I had measured and needed 23 posts, but I cut 25 for good measure. Now, steel posts, in my experience, are usually either green or red with a white or silver visibility top. I thought green would just blend into the corn in the background, so I chose red, specifically Vallejo Flat Red, number 70.957. I worked on a piece of baking paper because the painted post will stick to it less than it would to my work surface or to regular paper. Painting directly onto the ABS plastic requires a second coat, as the first coat basically becomes a primer. I wasn't concerned about painting the lower part that will be planted into the foam base. I actually painted the posts in several sessions to make sure they were painted on all sides and were well covered. When the red paint had completely dried, I painted the top approximately six inches of each post white. I didn't try to measure the length of the white tops. I again just eyeballed the work to make sure that they looked right. With all of the fence components prepared, I moved to the layout. Before I installed the fence, I needed to do a little scenic preparation. Primarily, I needed to apply dirt texture. I sifted a 50-50 mix of real dirt and buff tile grout over the entire area of the cornfield, including the edge of the cornfield itself. At this point, I was working just in the immediate area of the field. I'll add scenery to the surrounding scene later. The fine dirt texture did stick to the corn a little bit, but I was able to brush a finger across the corn and flip this dirt off of the corn while it was still dry. Next, I misted the dirt with 70% isopropyl alcohol, then applied a 3 to 1 mixture of water and matte Mod Podge to affix the dirt. My glue was a little old and I think some of the water had evaporated from it, so it was thicker than it should have been, leaving some pools of glue and thus some light spots on the finished product when it was dry. But this will cover over with other scenery materials as we go, so I wasn't too worried about it. I sifted a little more dirt texture over the top to try to even out the standing glue. I let this dry completely, and you can see some patchiness in the dirt, but again, further scenery material will cover this. Preparing to install the fence, I made a jig from a scrap of 40,000th styrene to help me space the fence from the standing corn. There's usually a strip of grass around the edge of a field like this, and I thought a scale 8 feet of grass around the edge looked right. So I made the jig eight scale feet wide and in the shape of an L that went around the corner. I also cut out the outside corner and the inside corner of the L to allow me to drill holes for the posts. The base here is half inch foam on top of a plywood base. So I was able to simply poke a hole in the foam with an awl, dip the corner posts into some white glue, apply a drop of glue to the bottom of the brace posts and plant the corner into the base. I know my hands are in the way a lot here. Unfortunately, there wasn't a good way to film this in this area as it's a difficult spot to get a camera into and get to the best angle to film this process. Next, I marked the placement of the line posts. I placed them 10 feet apart, which is within the range of prototypical fences. At this point, I realized I had created a full corner brace in the place where I had planned to put a gate. So I removed the front side of that brace and built a single brace and installed it on the other side of the gap for the gate. I made another jig of cardstock to measure the five foot height of the posts. I poked a hole in the foam base with my tweezers for each post and again glued them in with white glue using the jig to get the height correct. It's important to place the flat side of the posts in the direction where the wire will go. In this case, that was on the outside of the cornfield facing the aisle. I continued this process all the way around the field. Let me pause here for a second to say that if you're enjoying this video and you'd like to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques to help you build your dream layout, then be sure to subscribe down below and click the little bell icon so you can catch future videos. When the line posts were installed and the glue was dry, I applied the wire using rust-colored Easy Line. 
This is a stretchable nylon thread material, which is great for fences, for power lines, and for other cabling, and it comes in different colors. Personally, I use rust and black for different applications. If you haven't tried Easy Line and you need these kinds of lines for your layout, I'll post a link to Easy Line in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description down below this video. I encourage you to check it out. Again, I'm installing three strands of wire to this fence. I used that little cardboard jig that I had made for setting the line post heights, and I marked it and cut three slits in it at the height that I wanted each wire. I cut the easy line a little longer than each continuous stretch of wire, and at first I tried to install all three wires at once, but later I found that it was easy to install one wire at a time. I simply slipped the wire into the little slits I had made in the cardboard and used that to hold the wire at the correct height at each post. I wasn't sure what this would look like on the wood posts, and it did create some spotting on the wood, but it produced a realistic staining that you might see on real fence posts, so I wasn't concerned. As I typically do, I applied the CA with a fine micro brush with the head twisted off of it. As much as possible, I tried to apply the CA on the sides of the corner posts that would least show from the aisle. I used the jig to hold the line at the right height on each post. I started by gluing the lines at the corners only. Next, I built the gate. The total gate opening is 16 scale feet wide, so I built two 8 scale foot pipe gates. I worked on baking paper again and drew out the dimensions of one gate on the paper, four and a half feet tall and eight feet wide. I built the gate from styrene rod. I looked at a number of sizes. 30 thousandths rod is approximately four scale inches in end scale, so I went with that using evergreen stock number 210. I measured to cut one piece for the two sides and the top of the gate, and then I cut two cross pieces, cutting each piece slightly long so I could trim them to length while I went. Now, I have to say that if you try this method, take great care in the next couple of steps. I needed to soften this plastic to bend it to shape, for which I used an open flame from a candle. Now, I have a number of products that I work with that are flammable. I was very careful and very intentional to move all of those flammable products completely away from my workbench before lighting the candle. It's also a good idea to have a fire extinguisher near your workbench at all times. It's also possible to use a hot soldering iron for this process. I marked the place where I needed to bend the outside frame, passed it quickly over the flame, and bent it to shape. It took a little bit of adjusting to get exactly the right shape. Again, I wasn't worried about perfection here as farm gates, in my experience, get bent up over time. After extinguishing the candle and removing it completely from the workbench, I cut the cross pieces to length and glued them in place with solvent cement, one of those flammable products that I mentioned. I repeated this whole process for the second gate as well. When the gates were finished, I painted them. I considered using the same red that I had used for the fence post, but farmers are rarely concerned about these kinds of aesthetic matches, using mostly whatever is most readily available at the time. So I thought a color difference would make things look more interesting. I painted the gate Christmas green. Again, the first coat worked as basically a primer coat, so I painted two coats on both sides. Also, off camera, I stippled on some small patches of burnt umber to simulate rust around the hinge points and the weld joints. In the meantime, I continued with some scenery in the immediate area of the fence. I used a rounded file to press into the foam to make some tracks where tractors and trucks would enter and exit the field. I next applied grass texture. I first stippled on a few patches of the scenic glue, the same 3 to 1 water mod podge mixture I used before, in a few locations where I wanted some green undergrowth. I then sprinkled on some summer green fine ground foam. After a few minutes, I vacuumed up the excess. Again, this is only an undergrowth accent. I let that dry completely. Then I applied two millimeter light green static grass 
for the greener, shorter grass that grows down closer to the ground, even in the summer. Again, I wanted a somewhat clumpy effect with the grass, so I stippled the glue on in patches using an index card to keep the glue off of the corn. I then applied the static grass with my Woodland Scenic Static King. This is the very best static grass applicator I have used hands down, and I have used several. If you're in need of a static grass applicator, I highly recommend this one as it is powerful and also very, very safe and easy to use. I'll also add a link to it in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description below. Perhaps you'd like to check one of them out as well. I let this grass dry completely, then I came back and applied Sill Floor 4mm Autumn Colored Grass, using the same stippling technique as before. I wanted fair coverage with this tall, browner grass, but I also wanted some of the short, greener grass to show, as well as some areas of bare dirt. I applied the grass and vacuumed up the excess, catching the excess in an old stocking to save it for reuse. I thought this combination of materials made a pretty convincing patch of grass for midsummer in North Texas. When the grass had dried fairly well, I installed the gates using Beacon 3-in-1 glue. And with that, the fence was complete. I think this fence makes a pretty nice and highly needed component of my farm scene. I'm really excited about how this scene is coming along. So if you'd like to see the entire farm scene build and other model railroad content, check out the links on your screen. Remember my Amazon picks of the week, my Micromark discount code and other great links in the description down below. And join me now on Fridays as I bring you even more great model railroad videos. And I'll see you on the next video. Tin Lizzie?